I want you to make a conscious effort tonight to open the door of your heart. In Revelation, it talks about Jesus knocking on the door of the heart of the Laodicean church. You can be part of the church and have the door closed on him. I don't ever want my door to be closed. I want him to come and I want him to feast with me. I want him to break bread with me. I want him to, to reveal himself to me. It's wonderful what his hand can do. It's even better who he is. Hallelujah. When you seek his face, when you get caught up in who he is, all of the other things just come naturally and easy. When you know who he is. That's why Paul said that I might know him. Here he is all these years of ministry, all the ups and downs of ministry, and the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he's, he says, what's the bottom line here still with me? That I might know him, that I might be one with him, that I might experience him. So open up the door of your heart and just say, Jesus, come on in and sup with me, fellowship with me tonight. I want to be with you, Jesus. I don't want just what you have or what you can do. I know that you've told me in, my, in your word that you're going to meet all my needs according to your glorious riches. Your word says that if I'll just seek first your kingdom, what's right in your sight for my life, all of the things that I would ever need will be added to me. And so tonight, we love you, Lord. We're here to be with you. We're here to fellowship with you. And we know you live in each and every one of us. And we know that as we hear your voice coming forth from others in this room as Brother Todd ministers tonight, we're hearing your voice. We're receiving from you that lives inside of those that you inhabit. And we praise you tonight in the name of Jesus. If you're here tonight and you've been having trouble with one or both of your ankles in some way, I want you to just come on up here. If you want to be seated, feel free. Let's just stay in an attitude of worship before the Lord. If you've been having trouble with one or both of your ankles one of them, which one, your right one? Is it hurting right now? No, it's not. But what? It's, it hurts. Okay. She said it's not hurting right now, but when she sits for a long time and she gets up to start to walk, it starts hurting. It's hard for her to walk. Praise God. You too? Anybody else? Just come on up. Thank you, Father. Let's agree, church. Let's, all, let's gang up on the devil. That's what I like to say. In the name, there's the anointing right there. In the name of Jesus, be healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I command your ankle to become new. I thank you, Lord, for that new ankle. Command that arthritis to leave your body. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. Now, as I begin to minister to you and speak to you, I heard this inside me. I'm bringing a healing of the soul to Karen. I'm working in her soul. I'm working in her mind, will, and emotions. You know, all of us in our lives, the enemy comes against our soul, and God has to heal us at times. And there are times when he comes and he undoes something the enemy has done. And I just see God working in your soul, and he's ministering to you. He's going to rearrange some things. He's going to rearrange your thinking. You're going to see things from a different perspective. There's a certain element of fear and intimidation the enemy's been able to exercise against you that's leaving you in the name of Jesus. And the peace of God is going to rule and reign and rest upon you. The security of the Lord. You're going to feel so secure in him. <laughs> Oh, it's, going to be, it's just going to be beyond what you've ever experienced in the security of being in him. You're going to understand. You're going to start to understand what it means to really be in him and to have his protective covering over your life. And so thank you for that, Lord. We receive that for us tonight as well to work in our lives. And I thank you for Karen, Father. Yeah, you and your husband have some... Uh, 
some pathways to walk, some places to go, some things to do. God's going to use you more than you even understand in ministry and in blessing people, young people. People are going to come to Christ through your ministry. People are going to be healed through your ministry. People are going to enter into the fullness of what God has for them through your ministry. And the Lord says, so just open yourself up to me. Don't try to do it for me. Don't try to be something. You just let me do something. And I'm going to work. As you and I just sit and fellowship together, I'm going to supernaturally, powerfully change things in you, and the enemy of your soul will not be able to hold you back from what God has for you from this day forward in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. <laughs> yes, glory, hallelujah. We rejoice with you, Karen. 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 Hallelujah. He's good. He's good. Come on, let's rejoice with her. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Praise God. Praise God. What's wrong with your ankles, Bonner? Glory. Thought somebody fell out in the power under them. Oh, you already got it? Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He already got it. Your ankles? The left one. Oh, yeah, the one that you, uh, when you were playing soccer, right? No, no, okay. We like to have fun. Jesus has fun. The Bible says he's anointed with the oil of gladness. You ever look that word up in the Greek? It means wild joy. That's what it means. Hallelujah. We rejoice. I rejoice in what Jesus has done for you. We apply the blood of the cross right now to your ankle. Complete and total restoration, healing, miracle if need be. All that needs to be done in the name of Jesus. We receive it tonight in Jesus' name. New strength, says the Lord. New strength for a new day. New strength, says the Lord. New strength for a new way. New strength, says the Lord, is what I'm beginning to do and I'm going to raise you up, and I'm really going to use you. I'm going to use you beyond what you've been used before because I'm going to put before you a wide-open door, and the glory of the Lord is going to escort you in, and you're going to be a head over a ministry that will deliver many from sin. So you just rejoice, says the Lord, and let me in. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. We receive that, Lord. We let you in. We let you in so you can take us out. <laughs> we let you in so you can take us out into what you have for us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Both of them? One of them? Your right ankle. Hallelujah. Stretch your hands out toward Norma in the name of Jesus. Arthritis, you leave her body. I tell you, I'm not asking you to leave. I'm telling you to leave in the name of Jesus. You let go of her. Yes, hallelujah. Now, as soon as I said that, Norma, here's what I saw in my spirit. I saw a big, huge mega sign that said rejoice. I mean, it was like all I could see. It was like the whole world or was blotted out with the words rejoice. And I know that's the Lord's telling me to tell you that to just begin to rejoice. I mean, you can rejoice about things you don't think you even need to rejoice about. But the Lord is giving you, that. That's, I know that's a, a, a word from him for you. He wants you to just start rejoicing in him. Just rejoice in him for no reason. Just rejoice in him for uh, you know, a lot of reasons. Just rejoice in him when things are good. Just rejoice in him when things look bad. But rejoice, 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 rejoice. And you'll rejoice your way right into that new day, that new place. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I tell you what, Jesus' name. Praise God. Which ankle? That one? Is it hurting right now? It is. You know, God is setting women free. I don't have time to get into all the details of some things he's shown me, but you just watch. You watch. Women are going to be set free to be who God created them to be in the name of Jesus. 
O shabanda sata koba sisto premisete. You see, you don't have to worry because you're in my hand. And if your hand, that mean, in my hand, that means you're in my plan. That means you're in the place while I'll carry you each day. I'll cause you to know my Holy Ghost way. So you just love me and praise me as you go along. You just allow the Holy Ghost in you to sing that praise song. And as he sings and you and him do it together, you'll be able to weather every storm, every stormy weather. Do not be afraid of what you might see because I'm, work, I'm working in you to bring you into a place to be completely free. It's me, says the Lord. I'm doing it. It's me. It's me. You don't have to tense up. You don't have to feel condemned. You don't have to let the devil lie to you and tell you that you're in sin. You don't have to put up with any of that. You just tell him, no, get out of the way because I have stepped into the glory of the Lord and this is a new season and a new day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord wants you just to lay back in his arms and praise and worship him. And when you do, and you look to the Holy Ghost, he's going to give you a song. Many times. I'm not saying every time, but he'll give you a song. And when you start singing that a song, it'll just drive every demon that's trying to mess with your mind, trying to cloud your atmosphere up, trying to mess with your life. All you have to do is just sing a song. Hallelujah. Because you see, through Jesus, the Lord has turned your captivity. And the Bible says, when the Lord turned our captivity, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. Then was our voice filled with singing. Hallelujah. And even the heathen, even the enemies had to say, the Lord has done great things for them. Helen, the Lord has done great things for you through Jesus. So let your mouth be filled with laughter. Let your voice be filled with singing. I'm not saying your emotions and your mind is always going to want to go along with it, but it doesn't matter. They're going to have to just go along for the ride because you're going to praise and worship and sing and rejoice anyway. And as you put on the garment of praise, it'll get rid of the spirit of heaviness. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for my sister. I praise you. Yeah, there's the anointing right there. That sweet presence of heaven, that goodness that comes from his hand, that glory that brings forth his plan, the anointing of the Lord that sets you free, that fills your heart with joy and glee, that causes you to rejoice, causes you to dance, Causes you to praise him and even causes you to prance. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Praise God. Your ankle? Ankles? Okay. It's Okay. So it's your back projecting pain to your feet, huh? Ron, don't stop playing. Me and the angels like that. How's your ankle, Helen? How's your ankle? Better? Is there any pain at all? No pain at all. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. Well, Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Father, for what you can do and what you will do. In the name of Jesus, we worship you. Yes, I thank you that that's lifting off of his life in Jesus' name. <laughs> Oh, glory. You know, who you are in Jesus is a whole lot different than who we are just trying to do it ourselves or the enemy and his junk. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Everybody I've laid hands on here tonight, I've, I've seen them rejoicing and laughing and just enjoying life. You know why? Because God's not because, just because God's going to heal them physically, but because God is showing them through his eyes how he sees them. And how he sees their future. You have no idea how defeated the devil is. He's more defeated than defeated. He doesn't have a hope in heaven or hell. It's true. He's done. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. 
I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the anointing. The anointing in Jesus' name that breaks the yoke. God, I ask you for a creative miracle here if need. Uh, I ask you for a Yes, Lord. Well, thank God for what the doctors can do, but the, our doctor can do a whole lot more. He can even put new parts where they were before. He can create a new spine and bring it in line and bring it online too. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, for your complete work in Rain's body. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Amen. Praise you, Father. Amen. Were you hurting when you came up here? Where are you? How are you now? Feels better? Is there any pain at all? Swelling type stuff? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Praise God. The joint itself feels better. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for healing people. Thank you for healing your children. Thank you for blessing your children. We thank you, Jesus. You are our healer, and we rejoice in you. We're going to take what you said to us tonight, and we're going to live in it. We're going to walk in it. We're going to believe the prophetic word, and we're going to have the reward of the prophetic word in our lives this week in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor John, Pastor Karen. Praise the Lord. Flatwoods, Kentucky. It used to be named Cheap, Kentucky. Named after blind Methodist minister, Reverend Cheap. Not making it up. <laughs> named it Flatlands, and then it went to Advance, and I think it, then it went to Flatwoods. Amen? Uh, boy, it was really good. I was sitting there thinking, well, Lord, your, uh, Pastor John is demonstrating what I was going to do, and Pastor Karen is basically preaching what I was going to do. <laughs> I looked over and said, let's just go eat. <laughs> Leftovers, amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many was here this morning? How many didn't eat leftovers? Amen. Praise the Lord. You have to get the tape. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, not to preach Pastor Karen's message, but you know, one thing I'm learning about Joy, she, I mean, it was just, I love how God just builds stuff. You know, David was under the old covenant. He only had the Holy Spirit upon him. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Come on. We have the oil of gladness, the oil of joy. Come on now. And one thing I noticed he said here, make me to hear joy and gladness and be satisfied. And let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hold your face, uh, uh, hold your fa hide your face from my sins and blot out all my guilt and iniquities. This is David. Now listen to what he said. Created me a clean heart of God and renew a right, steadfast, persevering spirit within me. Cast me not from thy presence. Why did he not want to be cast from his presence? Because he knew in his presence was fullness of joy. And he said, take not your Holy Spirit from me but restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with thy free and willing spirit. Now watch this. Then will I teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted and returned to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. One of my, uh, uh, I have a lot of favorite scriptures. It seems like every time I preach something, I have a favorite scripture. But there's one of them. I forget. I want to say it's in Second or First Peter 4, 4. I could be wrong on both accounts. But he says, rejoice. And again, I say, Rejoice. Basically, that means this. Joy in God, and if you don't get enough the first time, just rejoy. Amen. Yep. Praise him. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You remember uh, uh, Bonner, I um, almost said Bonner. Uh, Bonner, um, um, he, he brought back uh, last year here. You remember, through faith and patience, we shall inherit the promises. Well, what is, is in Romans 5, 1 through 5, and then James 1, 1 through 4, in both accounts, it says that when you offer up, when you begin to rejoice in the Lord or count it all joy, what happens is God takes that your joy. Because when you start out, you start in faith believing you receive. And Jesus becomes at that moment the author and the finisher of our... Need to change that? Yeah, give him the hand. Hand the Lord. Uh-oh. Come on.
Oh, did I do something wrong with it? All right, here, let, well, let's try that. Praise the Lord. And if it goes out, it's your fault. Amen. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's all right. I enjoy that Marty Robbins songs. No, I'm just saying. Um, I grew up in Kentucky, but I like Marty Robbins. Isn't that funny? Praise the Lord. It's not funny? Okay. Well, you have not heard Marty Robbins, have you? Well, then don't answer a question you have no clue about. Amen. I have scripture for that, but I will not embarrass you. Amen. And you probably know what. But anyway, uh, now I'm thinking about Marty Robbins. <laughs> that makes me think I've got to be in El Paso by morning. Uh, no, uh, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> but what was I talking about just now? See, you got me through. Rejoice. Rejoice. Okay, I'm trying to think what it is. Oh, when you rejoice in the guy, you say, count it all joy. So what happens is when you rejoice, you already have faith. But what God does is in the hardest times of your life, when you count it all joy and rejoice, God takes that joy and he, he takes what you offer up to him. He in turn produces what you need called patience, adds it to what you got called faith right in the middle of your distress, grief, hardship, impossibility, and causes you to go where you need to go. Because it's through faith and patience we shall inherit the promises of God. You need to get the tape. Last year, faith and patience. Amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 8. I'll try to, try to get done before midnight. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. And at midnight. Praise the Lord. All right, no, uh, no comments from the free seats over there. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Anyway, praise the Lord. I think Pastor Mike and I could be on a deserted island and get rescued, and they would probably just say, so give us two more days. We're, we're having pretty fun. No, he'll go, no, I'm going home, amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 8. Now, I want to talk about tonight, I want to talk, share three things the Lord shared with me about healing. It's funny how this has just flowed this way. Because I, I want to tell you, a lot of times we are so conscious about our diet, but we don't deal with the stress in our life. Come on. You know, oh, I, I, got, I can't eat the yolks. I, I got to drink skin milk. Oh, I got to do this. I've got to make sure it's diet. I got to make sure this. Is. What's really killing you probably is the stress. Yes, yes. The, the inflammation, the anxiety, the worry, the concern, and all that. Amen. So tonight, I want to deal with some things, not just when I say get your healing. I'm talking about emotional healing. I'm talking about regret, shame, condemnation, hurt. Come on. Yeah. Distress. I'm talking about all the things that compile. Because one day I was sitting there and I felt like the Lord told me this. He said, if I paid it in full, then you should live in the fullness of what I paid for. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Take, take the whole thing. Amen. Come on. You know, I mean, we got a couple houses and then, uh, you know, my, I bought a house when it was real inexpensive back in the 80s. And, you know, it was about 900 square feet. My payment was $212 a month or 224 or something like that. Amen. My son's Taekwondo payments now are like 179 a month. So we just kept it and I never got rid of it. You know, and somebody's, you know, just paying whatever they need to pay on it. I'm letting somebody else pay my stuff. Amen. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so we got that. We got two cars. We got other little things and stuff. But, you know, we got insurance on each one of those, just about. But then there's an umbrella policy. You know, for a couple three hundred dollars, you can get anywhere from like two to thirteen million dollars. So, if your limits on your car runs out, then you're responsible for the rest of that above the three hundred thousand or five hundred thousand. So, for a couple hundred dollars more a month, you can go ahead and get an umbrella policy which covers everything. And after you run out of your limits of three or five hundred thousand dollars, God forbid you get sued or something happens or whatever medical, bill, all of a sudden you got that buffer called an umbrella policy. It kicks in all the way up to another million. It, so if it's 300000 you actually got 1.3 or 2.3 or 3.3. Well, it seems like God did that and backwards. When he, got, when he sent Jesus on the cross and Jesus died for the sins of the world, listen, if Jesus, whatever he died to, you don't have to live with. Amen. Come on, if he died to sickness, you don't have to live with it. But what Jesus did was, listen, he said, I'm going to pay all the premiums in my shed blood, and I'm going to do the umbrella package first, and underneath that, everything just is included, and don't forget all those benefits. What are they? Prosperity, finances. Come on, salvation includes all these things. Protection, safety, all these things. But the thing is, it says, forget not all his benefits. You know, the word uh, remind occurs five times in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, shows the intention of Peter's letters. 
It said, in this, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. In both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember. Faith doesn't come by having heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, when he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leopard and worshiped him, saying, Master, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him and said, What? I will be thou clean, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Those two words, I will, a lot of people don't realize the significance of it. The reason is, is, is that it, he has actually obligated himself to all humanity. Best way to put it is that Jesus Christ in Hebrews 13.8 is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Acts 10.34, Peter said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That means what he has no favorite children. What he'll do for one, he'll do for the other. But he will move over a million people to get to somebody that's in faith, believe in him. Because why? Without faith, it's impossible to believe him. Now, let's go to these scriptures real quick. All I'm doing is laying a foundation because I want to give you three things the Lord told me over the last four years because the last year I've been pretty healthy. I had one procedure and a couple of little things. But before that, I had two life-threatening diseases that was actually and, and symptoms in my body. They said, you should have been dead. And, you know, I just kept preaching, kept going, doing this. I didn't deny it. I just did not try to stay there. Amen? Because I believe when I got saved, April 28, 1974, you know, I really didn't get saved that day. I got saved 2,000 years ago on the cross. What happened was I heard the word. Now listen, don't get it mixed up with grace and all this different things because it's by grace through faith as you walk in love. You've got to have all three. The Spirit of God is called the Spirit of Grace. Jesus is the Word made flesh, which is the Word of faith, the author and the finisher of it, and God is love. So if you say, well, I'm just in grace, then I've said, well, what did you do with the Father and the Son? Well, I, I just walk in love. Love never fails. I said, what did you do with the Spirit of God and the Son? I said, you've got to have all three, and three are one and one in all three. It's by grace through faith as you walk and keep yourself in the love of God. So what happened April 28, 1974 was I heard O.L. Pokey Miller, thank God for his life and him and his wife. They really was wonderful pastors in the First Christian Church of Russell, Kentucky. I was about 12 years old, sitting up in the balcony with a friend of mine to my right named Shane Williams. I was kind of backwards and shy, weighed about 118 pounds wet. I had a plaid shirt that zipped up in the middle. It was matching with the back pants. I had white shoes on. I had soles on my white shoes about that thick in the front. In the back, they were about that big. When I walked down to get saved, if I'd have turned sideways, you wouldn't have seen me. I think they dipped me in the water and just don't get baptized, but just at least they could see a little bit of weight on my body. Amen. But I felt something in my left hand. I, I said, Shane, I feel like the Lord, he gave all, great altar calls. It seems like he, I, I said, it feels like somebody's trying to lift me up. He said, well, if I was you, I'd go down there. So I walked down. There was a guy I went to school with named Bob Lord. I just remember accepting the Lord, getting baptized, walking out in the foyer of that church. And I could still see the image in my head with the two double doors going out, out of the foyer of the church. I knew from that day on something had happened to me in my life. And I was never going to be the same. So what happened April 28, 1974 was I heard the word. Faith comes by hearing. I believed it in my heart. I confessed with my mouth. April 28, 1974 is when I just started living in the benefits of what was already provided 2,000 years ago. I said it this morning. We're not the sick trying to get healed. We're the healed resisting sickness. I'm not trying to, I'm not fighting for victory. I'm fighting from victory. Amen. Listen, I'm not the poor trying to get rich means full supply lacking nothing. I'm the rich resisting poverty. So in other words, you got to see yourself like Pastor Karen and Pastor John said this. You got to see yourself with a different image. It's not really of you getting a good self image. It's getting the God image inside of you. And one of the best things you can do is call yourself out by name. Look in the mirror and say, you are a king and a priest in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are blessed and greater is he that's in you. And call yourself out. Amen. To give yourself a pep talk sometime, amen? amen? If they think you're nuts, you say, that's fine, but I'm screwing on the right boat, amen? amen. Praise the Lord. So look at Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. This is confirmed in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. He said this, he said, and Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. There's your mouth of two witnesses right there. But the big thing is, is when you read in the Bible, it says in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray or wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. Yep. Comma. 
even as your soul prospers. That tells me you will not prosper and be in health. No farther past your soul prospering. The moment that you hesitate or you cannot believe, how many knows you cannot believe? It's impossible for you to believe past what you don't know. You cannot believe past what you don't know. Amen? So faith begins where the will of God known in the initial act of faith is speaking. So you've got to hear it in order to speak. I like what one gentleman said. He said the word of God was spoken so it could be written, and then it was written so it could be spoken. Amen? You know, the devil really doesn't matter what you believe. He just wants you to be silent about it. Amen? James chapter 5, let's look at verse 13 through 15. I'm just laying a foundation. I'm going to show you three quick things. Seriously, won't go too long tonight. Amen? But I'm not going to limit God. People are like, oh, you're, now, you're, now, you're, now you're dishing on it on God. <laughs> Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and... What's that word and? It's a conjunction. You remember the peanut butter and jelly I told you about? You can have 10 jars of peanut butter, but if you don't have no jelly, it's impossible to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But here it says, and the Lord shall raise him up. That means it's with it's not just getting healed, but it's also, and if he's committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Amen? So we know it's the will of God for us to be healed. We know what the word says. People say, well, there's some diseases that's come up since then. That it's not, I say, well, okay, let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Anything else that mentioned here that's not, it's also covered. You know, it's amazing. People really will argue with you to stay sick. Yeah. And I just sometimes agree with them. I said, just, Lord, make them sick enough. Not that he puts it on them. But, Lord, if they want to stay sick to the place to where they start believing something. But I don't do that. Amen. Come on now. People said, well, I don't believe in hell. I said, you will when you die. Well, that's kind of mean. I said, well, you're ugly, but we can go around too, amen? <laughs> so we know what the prayer of faith, what's the prayer of faith? Well, we know in Hebrews 11, 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, the word now there is not conditional into a time period, not like present tense. What he was doing was he's finishing something in Hebrews chapter 10. When he, then he said, now, it's like this. If I go up and say, all right, he was watching Bonner's game and this and that, but now... See, I went from one situation to another thing. So he was trying to take you from Hebrews 10 because it's not in chapter and verse, but he was changing the thought pattern here. He says, now. But then it still verifies it when it says faith is. Is is present tense. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. But evidence is proof. It validates that something exists, although you presently don't have it at the time. That's why you've got dinosaur bones out there. Why? Because they don't have a real one. But if a real one comes over the hill, you don't need the dinosaur bones or the evidence anymore. Why? You've got the substance of things hoped for. Now, if you look up the word hope, hope basically is this. It's a joyful, confident expectation. That's the best way you can do it. Pastor Karen hit on it. Faith is the substance of a joyful, confident expectation. See, when you are in true faith, joy is one of the signs. Yes. Amen? And I'm going to tell you something. Listen to this. They're hitting on stuff you really need to know because in the end times, one of the main characteristics, you can read it all through the Bible, is one is steadfastness, and the other one, one of them is they're going to be joyful. They're going to count it all joy. They're going to rejoice. They're going to be glad. Come on. Every time everything happened in the Bible for good, it seems like there was periods of joy that just flooded in. Amen? God takes great joy. You should take great joy. Amen? Don't let nobody steal your joy. So when you get in here and you start seeing all these different words about evidence and proof and all these different things, you start realizing that God has an address, and he lives in the present tense. So let's go on here and get into these three things, and then I'm going to go ahead and just, I, I, there's so many things, but I just felt like a while back, I thought, you know, I want to sit down and just put a sermon together of things that the Lord showed me, because I had um, five melanoma procedures on my ear. Uh, my wife seen it about two years ago, and she said, the Holy Ghost told me it was melanoma. She said, Todd, I'm sorry, but I, I just seen a spot. 
And I went to my doctor. He said, no, I don't think it's melanoma. Well, I, he tells me the facts, but I believe my wife heard the spirit of truth. Yes. Now, I don't argue with my doctors. I don't rebuke them. I let them be part of the process because they tell me the manifestation or the degree of it that I already have. Let your doctor be part of it. Don't go in there and say, well, I'm believing this. I don't receive that. I rebuke you. If I was on your doctor, I would tell you, you came to me. You go somewhere else now. <laughs> Let your doctor be part of it. Everybody needs to know what their mountain's called if you're facing a mountain. Yeah. Amen? Amen? He said, say unto this mountain. Amen? Amen. So wh what I did was I had the melanoma procedures, had reconstruction on my ear. They did all this. After three procedures, we quit counting stitches. It was 70 I know of. Then we got into the fourth procedure. They took skin from my neck, put it up here on my ear, and I finally asked the doctor one day, and jokingly, I said, hey, uh, does that mean if my wife kisses me on my ear, are we necking? Um, no. <laughs> he was like, well, whatever you want to call it, amen? But I did. I went in there. I'll be honest with you. I was just a tad nervous because, you know, I'm laying there, and he's working on my ear, and I kind of half-heartedly just said, hey, can you do me a favor? He goes, yeah, uh, this, is, this is the first procedure. I said, you know, I really don't want to look like a relative of Spock, and I don't want to look like I've been in a fight with Mike Tyson coming out of this thing. Hey, Amen. He said, well, no, I think we can, you know. Well, the other thing was, I was diagnosed several years ago, but lately it got really bad uh, with hemochromatosis. They said it was hereditary. Well, I didn't argue with anybody, but I already knew that when I got born again April 28, 1974, I went from one bloodline into another bloodline. Amen. Come on now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So I knew that then. I could deal with that and different things, not arrogant or anything, but I just knew that what to do. Sometimes you got to be where you're at. People come up and they said, well, do you think I need surgery? I said, yeah, I think you do. They said, well, you think I should break my glasses? I said, well, if you do, I ain't giving you a ride home. <laughs> you know, some people think, feel like they have to do a work to prove to God that they have faith. The best way you can prove to God you got faith is speaking. That's right. I believe, therefore, I speak. Amen? Second. Corinthians 4.13. So, you know, I got up there and then I had um, uh, different situations with the liver situation. It, my feet actually were turning brown on the side. I mean, it, it, you could see it. It was just brown. And they just basically told me that, okay, this is your pine period. You'll be on a liver transplant list and all this. And the pigment in, uh, your pigment's going to stay like that. And your, you know, all this. And one thing after another. I said, all right. Didn't argue with them. I said, what's it called? They said hemochromatosis. It was a hereditary thing. I really think that's what affected a couple of my brothers and different things and, and some other relatives in my family. But I got up there, and then I dealt with um, both retinas in my eyes tearing. It was one after another. Boom, 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 boom. Just almost broke my leg in the same place twice. In July, I walked out. Um, um, I was working on my deck. It was a freak accident. I had my leg already down on a two-foot deck about this high, and I was sawing boards, and the ones I was leaning against was actually nailed to the subfloor, but the ones I was sawing off wasn't connected to anything. It was no nails in it. But when I saw it, all of a sudden I twisted around 207 degrees, fell over backwards on my deck. My leg stayed the same. All of a sudden my leg shot up in the air. I landed on my back. I remember the clouds going across, and I heard the voice of the Lord speak to my heart and say this. Watch what you say. Same thing happened exactly almost. I heard the same word, watch what you say. The night before Thanksgiving, I was walking out of my garage. It was dark. We had black ice on our driveway, and it was slanted just enough that when I put my right leg down, my left leg, the same leg, was up, and that right leg came out, and I fell completely back. I remember grabbing my leg back here and shoving it down. I wouldn't even look. I just kept moving it. I had no feeling in my leg that quick, and I remember I was rocking myself, trying to get over on my feet. Finally crawled in the house and all that, but when I was laying on the ground, feeling the ice in my face, I heard the voice of the Lord again. He said, watch what you say. Both times I said, my leg is not broke. I will not need surgery. I do not even have a hairline fracture. No ligament, tendons, or nerves are damaged. I thank you. The healing power of God's working in me now to make me healthy in Jesus' name. So therefore, I am healed by your stripes. Amen? Well, one of the two times I went in, my wife says, Todd, please, just for me, Please, just go to the emergency room, urgent care. So about the third day I went in, the doctor just went, <laughs> x-ray. He just said, x-ray. Went in, came out, came back to the room and went, not even a hairline fracture. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So during this time, we was working on my deck and different things from a health storm. The Lord periodically would tell me something, and then he'd tell me something else, and he'd tell me something else. Three things he told me during that time. Now, there's some other things that went on and different things I'm not going to go into it. But I just want to just tell you this. My, 
eye doctor called me uh, several months back, and he said, listen, I, I just, I was in the eye doctor one time, six or seven times in one month. He was looking at my eye so much I couldn't even hardly see. He had to walk me out in the waiting room and set me down. And I was sitting there, and he said, uh, this is serious. He said, I don't care where you're at when you travel. If you see these flashes again, you need to go right to an eye doctor, wherever you're at. I didn't deny it. I just started doing what the Lord told me during those th that time. He just called me the other day, a few months ago, and he said, listen, he said, uh, both your retinas are perfect, and actually I've got to write you a new prescription. I said, what for? He said, your eyesight's improving. Praise God. My, I, I got a call about six weeks ago or two months ago from the, the, the doctor on my ear and different things because I had other procedures done on my arm and legs and different things and my ear five times. And, it for, uh, and he said this. His um, nurse called and said, listen, all I'm going to tell you is this. You're not even in the margins anymore. You are completely clear of any, any melanoma. Amen. So one thing after another, my leg has gotten so much stronger now, I just figured up the other day on my Fitbit since May, I've, I've ran on my legs 1.5 million steps. Now, let me tell you something. If you've got a damage in your leg, it's almost right at 1.5 million. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's why we get our healing. Now, I'm going to share the three things with you. And, it, it, and seriously, it's not going to take very long. Because I want you to say, you ever went to an IMAX movie? Just kind of lay back. Oh, you need to go, folks. Get out and do something. Amen. <laughs> Dear Lord, I mean, there's just so much of Oprah reruns you can watch. Amen. I mean, I mean, Fixer Upper. I mean, come on. Amen. Property Brothers. I know all you women watch Property Brothers. You don't. You're, you care less what the house is going to look like. No, I'm just teasing. Amen. My wife thinks they are. No, I'm just teasing. So, no. Anyway. Three things the Lord told me. Number one, I was walking through the house one day, and I still remember this. Is I can tell you the spot in the house. The Lord said, your tongue controls your body. I know it's really simple, but I'm going to show you some things. Your tongue controls your body. I raised my right arm, and I said, liver, I don't know where you're at, but I command you now to function yep. yes. in the perfection yes. to which God created you. Yes. If Jesus died to it, I don't have to live with it. I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And with long life will he satisfy me. Yep. Number two, all I heard was say unto. Say unto. When I seen, heard those words, I knew right off what the Lord was telling me. I remembered a story about Smith Wigglesworth sitting on a street corner. Smith Wigglesworth had 23 people documented raised from the dead. He died in 1947, I believe, right, right around the time that E.W. Kennedy did. Fam wonderful people, amen? But uh, great men of God. But he was standing there, very well dressed and everything. He even said that a knife would not cut, touch his body in life or in death. When he died, they examined his teeth. They said he had probably one of the most perfect sets of teeth of any person they ever seen. Come on now. He was standing on the street corner, very eloquently dressed and everything. He was a plumber before. His wife, Polly, was actually the, the minister. But he, when she passed away, he went in and rose her from the dead. She said, what are you doing? He <laughs> said, Smith, my time is up. You are now. It's your time. So what? I don't want to. He said, Smith, it's my time. My time's up. Your time. So he said, all right. He released her and went back. He became a pre the preacher. Amen. But Polly is the one that really got him to the Lord because he would lock the door and leave her out all night and she would sleep on the front porch. And when he'd get out to get the paper the next morning, he'd get up, she'd get up and go, good morning, and go in there and fix him a big breakfast and go on. You think Joyce Myers is really good? You better thank Dave Myers. Dave Myers is the one that helped Joyce. Everybody, we all need one another. Amen. So anyway, um, um, saying to, but he was sitting on a street corner and a lady came down off of a, a house and walked over and they was catching a bus there, I believe in London or somewhere in, you know, in the London area in England. And they were sitting there and this little dog came down and she said, now go on back up there. And sit there, <laughs> little tail. She said, now listen, the bus is coming. I don't want you to, you know, you need to go because when the bus comes, it's going to <laughs> When the bus came, she turned around and said, I said, get up there now, and don't you come off of that porch. Well, Smith Wigglesworth just out loud went, my God, woman, that's what you got to do to the devil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Whoever shall say unto, 
A lot of people talk about their problems, but they don't say unto them. You got to call them out by name. You got to speak to it directly. And then all of a sudden, I see myself sitting on that street corner. I don't know if it was the exact street corner, but I see myself. Everybody was gone, but me, I see myself on a street corner. I seen a dog come up to my right. I mean, this all happened right when the Lord spoke this to me, saying to. That's all I heard. It was the second thing. Saying to. And all of a sudden, you know when. You know, like, in, you, we call it gut feeling, but intuition, whatever you want to go. I believe it's the Spirit of God. But anyway, the dog, when it came up to me, I knew it was about ready to bite me. I just knew it. It was not if, it was just when. And I felt like the Lord said, now say unto it. I sat there and I said, you will not bite me. I command you to leave. You will not. I mean, I, I did it until it left by saying unto it. The third thing the Lord spoke to me, I was sitting there working on my deck again and different things. This is a period of different weeks. And I was sitting there listening to a gentleman I really enjoy, but I don't get to listen to him very much. But he kind of talks like this. And, you know, he's a pastor in Canada. And he said, yeah, we went in there. They had an incurable disease. And, you know, we prayed a couple of scriptures and laid hands on him. And they're here today. God is miraculous. I mean, he has created miracles. But when he talks like that, you're like... <laughs> Leon Fontaine, have you ever heard of him? <laughs> Wonderful man. Amazing healings in his ministry. So I turned it on to eat lunch, and he came on. and went, Oh, good. <laughs> you know, I was sitting there ready to eat, and the Lord ministered to me, and I heard this. This man's about ready to say something you need to hear. I put my sandwich down. I crossed my arms. I sat there, and he said this. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And he yeah. will quicken your mortal body. I'm telling you, something flashed right in front of me. I mean, I just sat there and I thought, wait a minute. That power that raised Christ from the dead, that spirit that raised Christ from the dead, is the spirit has a power in him called resurrection power. And if that spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me, then I have the resurrection power in me because of the Spirit of God that lives in me. So therefore, if life dwells in me, then death has no place in me. Amen. Ephesians 2, 1 says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but he quickened and made us alive. So if Jesus can take something dead, watch this now, if, if God by his Spirit took something dead with that resurrection power in his Spirit that could take something dead and make it alive, surely he can take something sick and make it well. Now, here's your IMAX movie. I want you to just sit back and relax and enjoy the show because I'm going to preach fast. You ready? The first thing the Lord said was your tongue controls your body. We know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, and 26, the first three words was, and God said. Nothing came into existence until after, say after. After God said it, and nothing will come into existence into your life until after you say it. I was on San, in San Francisco flying back to Denver one day. I sat next to a guy. I was in the aisle seat. He was to my right, and he was a scientist. So I was talking to him about this study I was doing on corks, Q-U-A-R-K-S. And I found out that these corks in the late 60s, mostly in the 70s, but now they have had more discoveries on corks to where they're different colors and stuff. And, but I just wanted a layman's term because I knew there was five phases that everything had to go through on earth to become substance. You know, like blocks are made of different things, metal, carpet, uh, this, the guitar, the cup right there even. Water has a different type of structure in it, different things. But every king that came into existence had to go through these different five phases. But the first phase was neutrons and protons. But since this discovery of quarks, it was now the first phase of the six, not five, but six phases. So I knew that if I could find out what that first phase was, that would come from the spiritual to the natural. You know what, I asked him, I said, what's the layman terms for corks? He started getting, I said, no, 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 I need very basic, simple. I already knew what it was, but I just wanted to verify it through him. He said, well, corks can basically be summed up as sound waves. Wow. So everything that came through existence came through sound waves. Yep. You know, let's say this pulpit was made out of wood. You know, if it was wood, then it was what before wood? It was a tree. What was it before a tree? Seed. So we can go tree, seed, tree, seed, tree, seed, tree, seed. All the, we can do that for 20 minutes. Or we could go seed, tree instead of seed or tree, seed. 
Either way, you're going to have to go back far enough to where all of a sudden something happens and God said. Amen. Are you all hearing what I'm saying here? Now, this is going to help you here. Watch this. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, that's you and I, rule over. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, and that the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed him the nostrils of nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. What's that word tr living soul translated? Speaking spirit. Hebrews 11.3, Pastor John gave me a really good thing on that, and I forgot, I need to get it from him. And it says, in God, for by faith we understand that the worlds have been formed by the word of God, so that what is seen has been made out of things which uh, was appear uh, appeared. Now, how did you say it? And it caused it to come in alignments. Yeah, all that, all that ex was to exist in time, when God spoke, he released all that, that would manifest any kind of substance or anything in that needed to be in time was created and released. And so, by the rhemas of God, the voice of God, the sound of God. Yeah, there's more. It, are you hearing this? Now watch this. It said this, thank you, Pastor John, so that what is seen has been made out of things which appear. Well, that takes us to 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Well, what's that? John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh, the, I mean, quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit and life. Well, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 said this, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That tells me that my voice is my address in the spirit. That tells me my voice is the only thing that will touch the spiritual and the natural realms at the same time. John 1, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When Jesus walked around, they said, what are you doing? He said, I only do what the Father does and I only say what I hear the Father says. So why is it so important to speak words? Well, we know Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Bible even says, let the weak say they're strong. Abraham's seed. He said, you are Abraham's seed. Learn to call those things which be not as if they are. God even sent his word and healed. In the midst of a storm, half asleep, Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. The centurion in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8, he said, I will go and I will go to your home. He said, no, I'm, I'm not even worthy that you come to my house. He said, I'm a man of me, uh, uh, over many, and I say unto this one, he goes and does. I say unto this one, he goes and does. He said, Lord, just speak the word only. Jesus marveled and said, no great, greater faith have I found in all of Israel. Even Daniel prayed in 21 days, the angel showed up and said, we were sent for your words. Why is it so interesting that on the, in the Tower of Babel that the Lord come down and said nothing will be withheld from them of what they could imagine. Why? Because they all speak the same language. In other words, so he had to do what? Confound their languages. That's why when you say something that doesn't make sense, we say you're babbling. But the opposite almost is on the day of Pentecost. When they got in one mind and one accord, they all spoke in other tongues. Amen? Now, I, I shared with you this morning about Mark 4, 24 and 25. Take heed to what you hear, for who has will be given. Who has not will be taken away. Why? Because words can add to you or words can take away. I said, especially to children, you can say words, be a demolition expert. It takes no thought, no talent, no ability. Just swing away with your mouth. Or you can stop and say something to that child that will put something in them that will last for a lifetime like an architect. Put something strategically in them. Say something. Give them a compliment. If you see a little child with glasses, say, I really like your glasses. Yes. Agreed. Come on now. If you see a child's kind of going like this, say, man, I don't know about you, but you have some of the coolest shoes I've seen all day long. And I've seen parents look up at me and go, 
Because it's just mom and dad telling them that. But when a total stranger tells them that, the words affect them in a certain way. So be an architect with your words. Now, one thing I want to say is this. It's so important for you to pray in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you build yourself up on your most holy faith. By how what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, how many of you heard my bathroom experience in the airport? Have anybody heard my bathroom experience? Praise the Lord. So good. Was you there? No, I'm just teasing. No. <laughs> I'm just, I give her a hard time. I like to embarrass people sometimes. They go, oh, what's right there? <laughs> I've been to a lot of restrooms and a lot of bathrooms, and one thing that messes me up is when they put the male and the female sign on top of each other like this, and they got a door here and here. Nine out of ten times, I'll go on the wrong one. <laughs> After a while, I wasn't even getting embarrassed. I just said, you know what? They need to put them right over the signs, amen? But I did. I, I, not at 9 out of 10, but getting wild. There for a while, I was like, uh, hello? <laughs> or I just sit there and wait for somebody to come out, amen? <laughs> but in California, you can go in anywhere, amen? <laughs> but there was one time, this was many years ago. So my dad was a builder. So sometimes I go in and see stuff. I go, wow, this is really nice. I think my dad would really be impressed with this. And, you know, he, you know so here's what happened. <laughs> this actually happened. I walked in this bathroom, and I went. Had my little carry-on roller back. I went, wow, this is really nice. They had water coming down off the little rocks. and little hand. They had little hand misters. They had little toilet booths that look like little booths that you go in and just sit down and eat. I literally almost forgot. I went, oh, I, I got, I'm in here to use the restroom. I went over and I used the restroom and got up. Guess what happened? The toilet flushed itself. Now you laugh now, but this was years ago. I went over and I was about to wash my hands and there was no hot or cold water, and I thought, oh, I cannot believe this. This is so embarrassing. They built all this thing. They forgot to put the water speck on it. <laughs> I look over, and there's a guy about four down going like this. I just called him Pierre. He was sitting there going like this. All of a sudden, water came out, and I went, well, Pierre must be pretty smart, amen? So I started, and water came out. I'm telling you, water came out. So I went over to do the hand pump for soap. You can see the soap, but you... Ain't no way to get it out. I look over, Pierre's gone. I'm on my own now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's see here. I went like this. My wife likes this noise. I sat there and I went, I went, that was cool, man. So I washed my hands again and I went, all right. Water came out. I can see the towels, but the towels are not there. I mean, the handle's not there. I'm telling you, it was almost looking like I was in Vegas doing a David Copperfield imitation. I was sitting there going like this. Now, later they put words on there, but I was on my own, folks. All of a sudden, I went... It went I turned around. I'm not lying. I turned around and went... I got it, I dried my hands off, and I walked out, and I kid you not, when I was gotten close enough, the door opened itself. It's like I had a Moses half anointing, amen? It just opened, and I went, my God, it parted. I walked out, I stood there, and the door shut behind me, and so help me, this is the thought that came to me. Well, that was a very pleasurable experience. I don't really have to go, but I wouldn't mind going through it one more time, amen? Now, what's my point? I was sitting on the plane. I was sitting there thinking about that. Wow. Man, the toilet flushed itself. Now, this was years ago. Water came out, just soap, towel, door opened itself. That was really good. I realized that whole bathroom had everything needed, but there was one thing it demanded from me. Motion. Everything is motion activated. And I kid you not, as I sat there on that plane, I was sitting on the left side in the window. I can remember about 18 rows back. I was sitting there with the window open. All of a sudden, I looked down, and it was like I could feel it in me go. 
and the Lord will begin to minister to me. He said, everything you see in that word has been provided for you, but there's one thing I'm going to demand from you is your voice. Because my word is voice activated. You have what you say. So what was the second thing the Lord talked to me? He said, say unto. Say unto. We know Mark eleven twenty three, 23. Amen. But let me give you these two. I got three little quick things here, and we'll go to number three, and we'll be done with one verse. 1 Samuel 17, say unto. How many knows when David ran to, uh, towards Goliath, there was a war of wards going on? Can I sum up the whole chapter for you in this? Goliath said, David said, Goliath said, David said, David ran towards Philistine, David prevailed over the Philistine. Yep, that's it. Wow. He said, you know what, I don't care who you are, I'm going to cut your head off, and the fowls of theirs are going to eat off of your flesh today. Amen. They tried to put natural armor on him, but he had a sword in his mouth. Amen. That's true. Come on, Mark chapter 4, you remember when um, Jesus was out in the wilderness? Let me sum up the whole chapter of Matthew chapter 4. Satan said, Jesus said, Satan said, Jesus said, Satan said, Jesus said, Jesus said De devil departed. So let me just sum it up this way. If you're going to defeat the devil, you better make sure you get the last word in. Come on. <laughs> Somebody said, don't talk with your mouth full. I said, it's full all the time when I got scriptures. Yeah. I am going to just spit it all over. Amen. Amen. The initial act of faith is what? Speaking. When your mouth gets moving, your feet gets moving, your life gets moving, your problems get moving, your lack gets moving, your sickness gets Come on, not yours, but the sickness gets moving. Yeah. Now watch this. Three times, even Jesus had to say three times before the devil left, the spirit of faith believes and speaks. Faith is released by speaking. If you don't speak, you lose by default. As I said earlier, the devil could care less what you believe as long as you remain silent about it. Yeah. So the first thing is what? Your tongue controls your body. The second thing is saying to. Well, we know that in Mark eleven twenty three. I got this little study on the Greek. Listen to this. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says this, For verily I say, this is Jesus saying it, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever saith, say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not die in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mm -hmm. Now let's break that down into Greek. Jesus said, For, for I, verily I say. What's that first say? It's Lego, L-E-G-O. It's actually in the Greek, a systematic set discourse of building blocks. It's the same word we use today as our Lego's building blocks. When you start to say something based on the word of God, you start connecting and building things in your life. Amen. Then he says this. That, then he said unto you, that whoever shall say, that's the first of the three says that he tells us. What's that first one in the Greek? Epo. The first one's lego. The second one is epo, E-P-O. In the Greek it means to command. Whoever shall command unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith, that's the second one. Now this one in the Greek is laleo, L-A-L-E-O, which means to speak out. Whoever shall speak out, what, but shall believe that those things which he speaks out shall come to pass. What does that mean? It's a journey. It will be on its way. Yeah. He shall have whatever he saith. That's the third one. It's the same Greek word that Jesus started with, Lego, a systematic set discourse. So I'm finding out that everything is really based around what you say and what you do with your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yes, so, you know, it's just, I don't know if you've seen the nuggets that Pastor Karen and Pastor John were given. Why? You've got to be thankful for gratitude. You've got to have a great attitude, but it's through gratitude. Amen? Now, the third thing the Lord spoke to me was what? Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I told you what the Lord showed me in Ephesians 2, 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but he quickened and made you alive. So if that power that's in that spirit, in the, in the spirit, not that spirit, but the power that's in the spirit of God called resurrection power, lives in you, then if he can take something dead with that power and make it alive, he can take things sick, depressed, come on, hopeless, despair, whatever, anxiety, whatever, and make them better. Now here's the best news of Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Y'all ready? What's the word quicken mean? 
The word quicken in, in, in the translation is this, to make alive with life, to make alive with life. It carries the ideal to revitalize, to rejuvenate, or to refresh with new life. So let's read it this way. He shall also make alive with life, revitalize, rejuvenate, or to refresh with new life your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Sweet water and bitter water can't dwell together, and I'm telling you, the spirit of death cannot dwell with the spirit of life. Those are three things the Lord told me, and I'm telling you, I've gotten all good reports. I told you I was going to be done. They're sitting over here, oh my God, it's a miracle. But we're not done yet. So did y'all get anything out of this tonight? Now, the reason I'm saying this is this. I believe when Jesus comes back, we're going to be like the children of Israel in this sense. When Jesus comes back, I believe we can get to the place like the children of Israel did when they left Egypt. Not one feeble one was among them. Come on now. People say, all right, tomorrow's Monday. Ugh. I asked somebody one day, I said, well, if you stranded on an island what, and you forgot that, what day of the week it was, how would you know when to have a bad day? <laughs> well, I never thought about that. You know what I want to say to people? If you just use the other half of your brain. Come on. I was sitting on a plane going to Las Vegas. It's been a while back. And a guy says, what are you going to Vegas for? Work or what, what you know, pleasure or what? I said, well, I'm actually a preacher. I'm going there to preach. He goes, you're a preacher and you're going to Las Vegas? It, I, just, I heard it come out of my mouth for the first time. I just, I just heard it come right. It was like head bypass surgery. I didn't even think about it. I just heard it come out. I said, well, I am a holy roller. Amen. He said, well, I never thought of that. Amen. Now, I give altar calls backwards sometimes. This is not peer pressure. People say, well, I had one person tell me, they said, hey, they're really upset. They said they felt like you gave them some peer pressure. I said, that's not compared to dying and going to hell. That's peer pressure. Yeah. I got a neighbor that's 96 years old, and she will do everything in the world. I mean, she, she's a tough. Her sister turns 100. Her other sister's 94. She just had a brother that passed away a year and a half ago at 100. She's had one sister that passed away at 88. Longevity. But she makes no excuses. She just goes out and does it. Well, one thing I noticed at age 96 is this. She will tell you what she thinks. She's not rude, but she's very direct. There is no mistaking what she means by the time you leave her presence. Why? She has no peer pressure. I have a friend of mine It's like a spiritual mentor to me. I mean, well, I mean, he's really spoken into my life. He says, and if they run you out of town, get out in front and make it look like a parade. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this. When we were in the, now I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason. Ten years ago, coming up, we were in Oral Roberts' living room. We were sitting there with some other different ministers, and we was in there, and they said, Dr. Roberts, you have suffered tragedy, setback. You've been accused falsely. You lost everything you had just about. You've done this and this. Now, he lived in a nice place. It was, a, it was kind of dated, but it was really nice. Tons of pictures of all these people in there. I actually snuck one in and hung it up. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, <laughs> but it's really funny what happened in there. But anyway, um, that's for another time. Um, well, I'll tell you real quick. We had a couple bathroom breaks. Back to the bathroom. And I went, and the host pastor, uh, Pastor Jeff Sutton, I mean Sutton, Pastor Jeff Walker was in there. And I came back around, sat back down with Wendy. I was sitting there like that. And then we got up, had another break. I went in, and Dr. Roberts, we waited until Dr. Roberts left, you know, got up. And he was in the bathroom. I kind of chuckled to myself. And the lady that was like a... Um, uh, it, she basically took care of him and stuff, you know, in case he failed and, or needed cooking or whatever. I mean, she kind of just stayed there for, like, different shifts or whatever. And she said, what's going on? I said, I said, I tried to go to the bathroom twice. I said, Pastor Jeff beat me into it, and now Dr. Roberts is in there. She said, come here. We walked down this hallway. <laughs> I kid you not. We walked from the bathroom. We went through a little small bedroom and then went back into this really nice bedroom. It was the end of his condo. 
and there was a bathroom in that, con that room. She said, when you're done, just come on back. I go in there, and I shut the door, and I sat there, and I went, this is really funny. I'm in Or Roberts' bathroom, and nobody will ever believe this. Amen? So I went over there. No, I'm just teasing. No. <laughs> but you want, me to tell you, you want me to tell you what really impressed me? Um, it was not all the brushes, how neat they were. Amen? <laughs> when I came out above his bed, he had a shelf that was made about this wide. It was as wide as his bed. And on top of it was old reel-to-reel -reel tapes so he, with headphones, I think. He could listen to the Word of God. They said he would write and read almost eight hours a day. And when he was sitting there reading to us at 80-some years old, he, had no gla he, he didn't even use glasses. What I'm trying to say is this. They asked Dr. Roberts of all the things he's went through. His wife passing away, losing a child. I mean, you know, he, they didn't bring it up. They said, you've suffered tragedy, setback, heartache. You've went, but now you're saying you're just as anointed as you were when you were in the 50s healing revival? And that you're going to be like an old horse and die with your saddle? I mean, he, this, he said, well, how do, he said, he said, how, how do you put up with all the accusations and persecutions and, I mean, all the meanness and attacks. I'll never forget what he did. He was sitting there like this in that chair. And he went like this. He straightened up a little bit. Put his shoulders back. And this is all he said. The dogs bark, but the train keeps moving. Amen. <laughs> Listen, folks. Don't let their voice silent your voice. You got, listen, you are the, you, the only thing that can slow your train or stop your train is you. I don't care how many dogs are on the tracks. After a while, next time you come through, you might see a lot of three-legged dogs, but don't stop. <laughs> are y'all hear what I'm saying? The listen, the dogs bark, but the train keeps moving. Now, I do altar calls a little bit backwards at times. Now, how many of you are born again, know you're going to heaven? Raise your hand right now. Keep it up. Hold it up. Are you born again? All right, born again. All right. People say, why do you do this? Well, most people are already born again. They ain't no sense it's waiting around for five or ten minutes trying to get somebody to come up that is not in the room. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Now, here's what I want to do. It's only about seven minutes to eight. I know some of you have already been had hands laid on you. Listen, it's not just for physical. But I believe when you come up, if there be any sins, God will forgive them. See, the thing is, most people have is this. There was two things that came on Adam. He said, well, how, who told you we were naked? Yeah. Guilt and shame. First two things that came on Adam, guilt and shame. That's why they hid themselves. Yeah. A lot of us don't even know. It's so seated and, and, and shoved down. We're almost deceived. Well, we are deceived a lot of times that we don't even realize we have the complex of guilt and shame, no matter what, like Pastor Karen said, what the Word says or all this. God will take you through a process of either purging or cleansing or whatever, but the thing is, is he's always working things together for your good. But the thing is, is when you come up and get hands laid on you, it's not the fact that you're getting a physical healing only. You're getting emotional healing. Sins will be dropped off of you. That's what I said. I just read it to you. But the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Save the sick. You know, you could be physically well but sick emotionally. Sick in your image. Come on. So I don't know what you need. You don't even have to come up. I'm not going to even make you. But if you come up, we're just going to lay hands on you, and we're going to let God watch over his word to perform. Signs follow. He says, you shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I don't even think about it. All I do is lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You know, I don't know if you notice this, but I like to pat people on the shoulder or go up and shake hands with me. Have you noticed that since I've been here? I love doing that. I go up and just go, hey, how you doing? Give somebody knuckles. I don't need to know what their situation is. I just need to know what I've got and what I believe. That's the same as laying hands on it. I remember when we went in September of 98, I just wrote a simple letter. I just like Ronald Reagan. I just wanted to meet him one day. You know, some people like sports people. Some people like this. Some people like movies. I just wanted to meet Ronald Reagan. I thought that'd be really cool. 
Man, they wrote me right back. They said, well, send us this. We'll set an appointment up in a few weeks. I flew out to California, getting him went in his office, sat there and talked to him, shook hands with him and everything. People say, you pray for him? I said, absolutely, I prayed for him. I didn't say, President, Mr. President, I'm going to pray for you right now. In the name of Jesus, I just pray. <laughs> no, you know what I did? They just kept saying, will you please shake hands with the president again? I said, we sat there and we shook hands. I'm laying hands on the president right now. I believe what I'm laying on hand. Look, I, I don't know what he needs, Glenn, but I believe right now whatever he needs, he's getting it because by faith, I believe when I touch somebody, they receive. Amen. Come on. People, well, 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 what will people think if I just go up and just say, hey, you go ahead on the plane first. You know, people are going to talk about you whether you do it or not. You might as well just do it and have fun. Amen. 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 <laughs> that one gentleman that was telling me about getting out in front and make it look like a parade, he had somebody come up to him and said, man, you're getting fat. He said, well, you're ugly, but I can lose weight. <laughs> How many knows you got to have fun in life, amen? <laughs> oh. People come up to me and go, man, you're not good looking. I said, you should see my twin brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he's standing behind you, and he's 6'5". Yeah. <laughs> All right, I know when I get Bonner to laugh, i got to quit. Uh, that's a courtesy laugh, I can tell. Uh, who wants hands laid on you tonight? I don't know if you're in distress, anxiety, worry, regret, shame, condemnation. I don't know what it is. But I believe if you might be carrying around sins and God has forgiven you 18 years ago, but you still won't forgive yourself. Come on up, whoever. Come on up. Come on, we're going to lay hands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Lord. Pastor Karen, you want to help Pastor John? It's up to you all. Yeah, come on up. We're just going to, we're just going to lay, lay, we're just all going to through and lay hands. Here's the first, here's the only thing I want to ask you. you. Have you ever went to meet somebody very important and they say, uh, we're walking this way, let's get over here? If you want to get in somebody's presence, you got to follow or get into that area. They, fourth floor as a century city. That's what they told me. That's where you'll meet the president. Go to the lobby first. Just say you have an appointment with the president. I thought that was so cool. <laughs> and I went up there, and me and my friend walked in, and there he was. But what we had to do, we had to get in the address. We had to get where his geographical location so we could get in his presence. God's geographical location is the present tense. So I'm going to ask you one question to get you there right now. Do you believe that when we lay hands on you, God is going to do something great in you. Yes or no? Let me hear yes. it. Yes. Yes. You don't need to say another word. You just allowed God to get in the realm because your voice allowed him to meet you right where you're at. The present tense. Amen? Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we can we praise you. I lay hands upon thee. I just thank you. The healing power of God is working in them. And that burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God is setting you free from whatever it is. Physical, financial, social, emotional, whatever. Even in your family, I pray that the eyes of people's hearts will be enlightened. Amen. That they will know, yes, all the things that you have sown will come to pass. And you've always thought, Lord, is how long will this last? But I believe it's going to come to pass sooner than you think. You just mark it down because you've always believed the red with the ink in the Word. So just believe it. Lord, I thank you right now. Even as we think, we believe and we speak in Jesus' name. I loose the healing power of God. Father, I loose the anointing of God right now. 